Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have never offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am already sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your vows of mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the Word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the Spirit, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I therefore forgive you all of your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The first reading is from the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah, the 50th chapter. The Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught, that I may know how to sustain with the word him who is weary. Morning by morning he awakens. He awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting, but the Lord God helps me. Therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me, who will declare me guilty. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from St. Paul's Epistle to the Philippians, the second chapter. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count the quality with God a thing to be asked, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Christ entered once for all into the holy places by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Because of the length of the reading of the Old Testament lesson, we were made seated. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 26th chapter. Then two robbers were crucified with him. I'm sorry. <coughs> when Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, You know that after two days the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the place of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. 
But they said, Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. Now, when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask with very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at table. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble this woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. Can you pour in this ointment on my body? She has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed to the world, what she has done will also be told in the name of her. Then one of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him thirty pieces of silver. From that moment he saw an opportunity to betray him. Now, on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man, and say to him, The teacher has, says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he reclined at table with the twelve. And as they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. They were very sorrowful and began to say to him, one after another, Is it I, Lord? He answered, He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Lord? He said to him, You have said so. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. He took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of, again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. And after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered, Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you this very night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. Then Jesus went to them to a place in this, with them to a place in Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. Taking with him Peter and the sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. He said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death, remain, remain here with me and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is good, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass until I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, for the Son of Man is betrayed to the sinners. Rise, let us go. See, my betrayer is at hand. Now, later on, Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came up and, to him and said, You also were with Jesus in Galilee. But he denied it before the day, saying, 
I do not know what you mean. And when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man is with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. And he began to invoke a curse upon himself, and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed, and Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate, the governor. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even a single charge. So the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Who do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. <coughs> Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife had sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, which of the two of you do you want me to release to you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then tell me, what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when, Jesus, so when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather than a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and our children. And then he released for them Barabbas, having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Now, from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus Christ called out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lemon na sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, This man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to him and save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, and he yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earth and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly this was the Son of God. <coughs> there were also many women there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee ministering to him. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of the sons of Jebedee. When it was evening, there came a rich man of Arimathea called Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered that it be given him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there sitting opposite the tomb. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that imposter said, While he was still alive, after three days I will rise again. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, 
lest his disciples go out and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead. And the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting the guard. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Taking the form of a servant, 
being in the likeness of men, being found in human form, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So what kind of king and messiah is Jesus? He's the kind who came humbly born of a virgin, as prophesied by the prophet Isaiah, born in a stable, <coughs> closed with the mother. In contrast to the kings of this world, Jesus is the kind who came to be a servant to all. The kind who chose to show mercy rather than put his enemies to death by the edge of the sword. He's the kind of king who did not count his power and glory and greatness something to be lorded over those who are weak and die. Jesus is the kind of king who comes bringing peace because he is the prince of peace. Jesus is also a king of justice, but not as the world brings. The world produces the most unjust rulers and tyrants. As Lord Acton once said, power corrupts. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. But Jesus is the kind of king who is not corrupted by power. Rather, he changes and makes perfect that which is corrupt. He's the kind of king who takes that takes care of more than just the physical wounds of his people. As Luther said, he's no mere bread king, providing food for the belly. Instead, Jesus is the bread of life, who gives himself as the bread for the needs of the sins of the world. So whosoever believes in him, consumes him, believes his word and trusts in him, will not perish, but have eternal life. Because Christ comes to be the king who delivers his people from their sins and even death itself by bringing forgiveness to those who are his disciples and followers. Because that's what the true Messiah does. And Jesus is the kind of king who lives up to his name. Jesus, God, who will save his people. That's what the people were asking when they were chanting, Hosanna, God, save us. And of course, just as Isaiah prophesied, he's also Emmanuel, God who is with us. God who is not far off, but God who is as near as his word in our ears and in our mouths. Because our Lord Jesus, he's the kind of king who came to die that others might live eternally. He's the kind of king who shows his obedience to his father and his love for others by sacrificing himself for people who have done nothing to deserve it. And because of that, he's died for the sins of all the people. You and me as well, even unbelievers. You see, that's the kind of king we have. The king of love, my shepherd is. And Pilate, as Jesus confronts him, he has these words to say. Jesus responds, saying, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom was of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I may not be delivered over to the Jews. My kingdom is not of this world. And that's why we can't expect the kings and kingdoms of this world to make our lives a paradise here. We have a different kingdom where we find our kingdom. Our eternal hope and our joy is not to be found in the things of this world alone. Yes, we want our earthly princes to be just and good. We want our presidents to be honorable and protect our nation and its welfare. But these kingdoms will always fall short. The desire and greed and lust for power will always take their toll on those who are morally weak. The temptation to put our power and authority to use in serving our own fleshly desires is often too great for the kings of this world. As we've seen many times in the past, and not just among kings. Lust, greed, selfishness strikes much closer to home, wherever we are, in the workplace, certainly in the government, but also in the church, at school, even in our homes. There are times when we fail to be the kinds of leaders that we are called to be as Christians, whether it be in the family or at work. There are times when we fail to love others as ourselves and put the needs of our neighbors first. Sadly, all too often, we put our needs ahead of everybody else's. Therefore, all earthly rulers and authorities are suspect. For all earthly rulers fall short of the glory of God and the righteousness of Jesus our King, because just like us, all earthly rulers are tainted by sin. Now, men have made laws, will continue to make laws. They
things that our conscience can't abide. And because of that, our allegiance must be to Christ and His Word first and foremost. Because He alone uses His divine authority not to serve Himself, but to serve others. It doesn't mean that earthly rulers can't do good or be used by God. God even used Pilate to give the Jews an opportunity to repent. Over and over, he asked them, Behold your king, what do you want me to do with him? But sadly, what's their response? Crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. Remember, the Jews were supposed to have no king but God. But sadly, they had abandoned their faith. They even go so far as saying, Let his blood be on our heads. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Pilate will be the one to place the plaque below Jesus' head, which declares Jesus' kingship during his crucifixion. Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. But Pilate does so not because he believes that Jesus is a true king, but rather to shame the Jews for their forcing him to crucify an innocent man. So while Pilate may not believe it, his words are true. Jesus Christ is the king of the Jews. But he's also so much more. Jesus is Lord of all. What Pilate could not know was that because Jesus was the Son of God, Jesus was Pilate's king as well. He just didn't have the faith to believe it. That's why in the end, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Because on the last day, even those who are unbelievers in this life will have, be confronted with the reality of Christ's eternal kingship. Sadly, even Jesus' own people, the Jews, rejected their servant king because he wasn't the kind of Messiah they wanted. Instead, choosing the world and their own sinful desires over the Son of God, they chose to put him to death and release the murderer. This is true for all who choose to pledge their allegiance to the world and the flesh rather than to Jesus, the Word made flesh. And of course, we too, all too often, put our heart in the shame as well. Because every time we sin against one of God's laws and commands, knowingly doing what God has told us not to do, guess what? Christ's blood is on our hands as well. Because every time we sin, and try to convince ourselves it's not sin. Take say to ourselves, that doesn't matter. That's no big deal. God will forgive me. And we too are no better than the murderer for us. Whenever we ignore God's word, doing or believing whatever we think is right in our own eyes, we are no better than the taunting Jews who demand that Christ come down and save himself. In fact, when we turn away from God's word or use it to suit our own needs, we're no better than the devil himself, who would put God's word to the test, testing God's love to really prove that he's worthy of our worship, praise, and obedience. What does Jesus do? What's our king's response when we fall into such a temptation? Just as the notorious murderer Barabbas is set free, our Lord takes the punishment that we deserve. Because just like the thief on the cross, who is crucified next to Jesus. Jesus is put to death so that murderers, adulterers, liars, cheats, thieves, that includes us, will be forgiven and receive eternal life. Because what kind of king is our Messiah, our Christ? Is the fact that he humbled himself, become man, be born of a virgin, suffer and die, mean that he is weak and helpless? Remember, Jesus said, I lay down my life. No one takes it from me. He died when he decided it was finished. Just remember the words of the Apostle Paul to the church in Philippi. Therefore God has exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We do exactly that when we humble ourselves to kneel before his cross. Actually, humble by God's law, we turn to Christ, trusting the gospel. Remember that Jesus, as he was hanging on the cross dying, could have called down the heavenly angelic host to do his bidding. He who spoke the world into existence could have destroyed those who were taunting him and who pierced his flesh with the nails. Your Lord, even hanging on the cross, had the authority. 
authority to call down fire from heaven to stop the mouths that were deriding him. Christ was only helpless because of his own willingness to die and be obedient to his heavenly Father for your sakes and mine. To the Jews and the Romans, no earthly king or president has any real authority over our king. And that's why as he hung on the cross, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Just as we often do. They were sinning against God, and they didn't know or care. They didn't realize who their true king was. Their king was their bellies and their wealth. And so it is for all who deny Christ, even more of the things of this world, and not caring about his good of life. But for us who believe, Jesus is our king. We have no other king. We need no other king. We willingly submit ourselves to the princes of this world. But Christ alone is the one we are to follow. We do that by listening to, learning, and hearing his word. You see, no other prince or ruler of this world can bring you peace and reconciliation with God. And that's what counts. And Christ has done that. Despite our sin, our tongues do confess that Jesus is Lord, that he is our King and our God, even if we don't always live as if we actually believe that. Every time we confess the creed, what we memorize in the small catechism, that I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten the Father from all eternity, and true man born of the Virgin is my Lord, we are confessing our faith. We confess before man the faith that we share in God, our King. Every time we make the sign of the cross, we remember our baptism. We remember that we've been baptized in Christ's crucifixion, death, and therefore his resurrection. We too remember that our Lord had a crown of thorns crushed into his head. He has placed the crown of life upon us. Every time we hear and believe the blessed words of the gospel, your sins are forgiven and shed for you, your king is telling you how much he loves you, that he's done that for you. So what kind of king do we have? Without a doubt, the kind of king who cares who we eat and who does. But our king did not sacrifice himself in vain. Because it is in his death that our king saves his people by dying for their sins. Not ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. And that's why we, who are subjects of this noble, glorious, resurrected king, can boldly proclaim even to the most hardened of sinners, the most mocking of atheists, Christ Jesus died for you. Because we know that while we were yet sinners and enemies of God, Christ Jesus died for us as well. And this is what makes all the difference. But also this, too. We can rejoice that our King is not dead and gone. Our King has risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity. Because he was raised from the dead in the glorious resurrection that we will celebrate next Sunday, we too have the promise of eternal life. Therefore, as the people of God have always said, Hosanna, save us, Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the Son of David. Glory to God in the highest. We thank the Lord for his sacrifice for us.